It's really great to be here. I'm going to talk about how Black Deficit entered the, the British Academy, and you can already tell that I'm extremely <coughs> UK-centric. <laughs> it's all about Britain, right? Um, but I hope that the story I'm going to give you um, will have some resonance, maybe dissonance, with um, what you guys do here and the kind of issues that you think you face. So I'm really interested in finding out how you're going to... Um, engage with what I'm talking about. We're going to have real fun. <laughs> so here are some criticisms of recent attempts to decolonise the British Academy. I don't know, have you guys been doing this kind of thing here or has it come up at all? This stuff about decolonise the curriculum? And Today? Today? <laughs> wow. Alice. Yeah. Wow. Well, it's, be, it's been happening. <laughs> it's been happening. Um, but here are some of the criticisms. The right of students not to be offended is detrimental to the ethos of higher education. Snowflakes. Taking offence at a white curriculum and a white institutional space is a form of, quote, cultural policing driven by a desire to censor history, literature, politics and culture. It's about censorship. There exists an almost fascistic urge by young minds to wipe away the past so as not to grapple with intellectually difficult questions. The intellectual environment should not be moulded by the identity politics of race, but by the intrinsic worth of political ideas. That's another critique. And finally, identity politics degrades intellectual inquiry by levelling all knowledge as equally competent, i.e. vulgar. Now, at stake, argue the critics, is a defence of higher learning as an unqualified space of critique, curiosity and discernment against a contaminating wave of identity politics, narcissism and vulgarism. And I want to turn these defences of the academy, as it is, to face the predicament of black students, especially students of African heritage in the UK. These UK stats are very worrisome. Black students' experience of higher education is significantly more negative than any other ethnicity and their attainments, on the whole, are significantly lower than any other ethnicity. So 77.3% of white females in the UK attain either a first or a 2-1. I don't know what grading system you guys use. Same one, yeah, so they get a first or a 2-1, 77.3% of white females compared to 46.3% of black males, so that's a difference of over 30%, right, and if you think about how graduate jobs are all predicated upon you getting a first or a 2-1, you might start to see now how this racialised difference at university leads into racialised difference in social mobility and life chances afterwards. Now, some take comfort in presuming that black students arrive at the gates of university with pronounced social and cultural deficits emanating from their familial and community upbringings. In other words, it can hardly be the hallowed academy's fault. Black students must be able to set aside their blackness so that they can enjoy an interval an interval of being at university just as a student. And if they can't, then it's tragic, but it's not the scholar's fault. Yet all the evidence so far points to the fact that these racialised differences are produced within the academy during the course of undergraduate education. It's not that black students come in with less A-level results, less high school results. That's not the case. They, those black students who come in with the same as other white students are still likely to come out with that 30% difference. In other words, the differentiation of experience and success can't be causally attributed to the baggage that black students supposedly arrive with. And this evidence provides grounds for pondering the unthinkable. Maybe university does not allow black students to leave their blackness at the gate. It might be the traditional academy itself that breeds identity politics, narcissism, and vulgarism at the same time as it promotes critique, curiosity and discernment. So maybe the academy itself breeds 
identity politics, narcissism, vulgarism, at the same time as it promotes critique, curiosity and discernment. And these paradoxical pulling aparts might in some way be racialized. Well, as recent campaigns have sought to recontextualize and recurate the white curriculum and white spaces of the British Academy, I'm going to recontextualize and recurate its production of black deficit. Specifically, I'm going to work through three intellectual dispositions towards the black presence in British Empire. White abolitionism in the late 19th and turn of the century, late 18th, should say, in turn of the century. Colonial development in the interwar and war years and race relations in the immediate post-World War II period. So white abolitionism, colonial development, and race relations. And I'm going to look at how each disposition grappled with the cultural deficiency and cognitive incompetency that was said to accompany the black presence. And I'm going to place these dispositions within the history of the British Academy. Each disposition owed something to the previous formation in terms of its intellectual arrangements and ethical determinations. And so my claim is that black deficit entered into the academy with a firmly imperial provenance and it has yet to leave. So white abolitionism. And white abolitionism distinguished itself from pro-slavery lobbies by arguing that enslaved Africans were human rather than things or animals. But white abolitionists also assumed that slavery had such a debasing effect that the enslaved could be considered human in biology only. The freed slave would therefore have to be trained over generations into the civilised competencies that would allow them to fully enact their humanity. And that was William Wordsworth, uh, not William Wordsworth, William Wilberforce's position. William Wil Wordsworth was different, actually. <laughs> but anyway. Wordsworth? He wrote a very famous ode about the Haitian Revolution. So a shared humanity, say the white abolitionists, yes, but a hierarchical adjudication of the cultural competency to be human. So even in a shared humanity, some had the cultural competency to be more human than others. The Ethnological Society of London emerged out of abolitionism in 1843. Fittingly, given abolitionist motto of one blood, ethnologists understood their object of inquiry to be the family of humanity, albeit a hierarchical family, and they by and large professed a diffusionist explanation of notable cultural differences within this family. Well, in 1863, a guy called James Hunt engineered a split by establishing the Anthropological Society of London. Hunt, was an anti-abolitionist, a white supremacist, and a sub subscriber to hereditary explanations of difference. Hunt's position, while a minority at the time, was nevertheless propagated by influential personalities such as Walter Bajou, the editor-in-chief of The Economist. Bajou made the claim that reason was physically inherited. There's still a column in The Economist, if you read it, called Bajou, right? Reason was physically inherited. The white mind was smoothed over eons by the exercise of reason. The black mind was ruled by base instinct, which remained congealed in its crevices. I, I'm, not, I'm quoting. There could be no cultural amelioration of this cognitive deficiency. This is Bajou. Imitation would be no more, would no more make a Negro out of a Brahmin or a red man out of an Englishman than washing would change the spots of a leopard or the colour of an Ethiopian. And, and abolitionists, by the way, always use that biblical passage about uh, can a leopard change its spots, can the Ethiopian change its colour in the, for their justification for, for getting rid of slavery. For empirical proof of his de design, Baju pointed the reader towards the works of Edward Tyler, that's the hipster with the beard. <laughs> Being the first professor, the first professor of anthropology in the British Academy. In fact, Tyler was entirely opposed to the hereditary argument for human difference. Following the ethnological motto of one blood, 
Tyler argued for humanity's shared cognitive potential in distinction to racial lines of hereditary mental deficiency. What made difference, said Tyler, was cultural change. Now, Tyler argued that primitive survivals were rational by their own logic. Nonetheless, in comparison to civilised rationality, that primitive logic revealed itself to be deficient. So Tyler entirely accepted the hierarchies of cultural competency that were fundamental to white abolitionism in this post-emancipation era. James Fraser, in the middle there with the chin, the first scholar in the British Academy to hold a professorship in social anthropology. Jim provided a cognate argument. Human culture evolved through magic to religion to reason. And the specific task of social anthropology was to study this evolution through the primitive societies of the past. Same as Tyler, Fraser defended a common human potential at the same time as he underlined the cultural deficiencies of the contemporary savage. In fact, so marked was this deficiency for Fraser that in light of the imperial expansion of European civilization, he suggested in another quarter of a century, there will be little or nothing of the old savage life left to record. Finally, let's consider Leonard Hobhouse, Britain's joint first professor of sociology and who made similar arguments to his follicled friends. Against the hereditary argument, Hobhouse understood civilization as the growth of what he called the social mind, meaning that the more rational and critical the individual cognition, the more this cognition would be conscious of the universal conditions required for unity. But again, just like Tyler and Fraser, Hophouse was keen to mark the cultural distance between contemporary savage and civilised cultures. In fact, even if on the face of it some savage cultures shared civilised practices, like monogamy, this sharing, says Hobhouse, could not be supposed to infer any deeper identity. Such affinities were to be adjudicated not by cultural practice, but by reference to the evolution of the social mind. In other words, contemporary savages, if capable of some cultural competency, were still deficient in cognitive competency, an ability to reason in a universal fashion. And guess what? For Hobhouse, it was through European empire that the social mind universalised and thus compelled the evolution of contemporary savages. So what can we take from all this? As they become bona fide disciplines in the British Academy, anthropology, social anthropology and sociology oriented towards the contemporary savage through a white abolitionist disposition. And this disposition was comprised of a number of elements. Firstly, it mounted a defence of common humanity against a theory of evolution that argued for the hereditary differentiation of cognitive competence. Secondly, it mobilised an alternative evolutionary narrative which marked a hierarchical difference between savage and civilised cultures. Thirdly, it associated cultural evolution with the advance or retardation of cognitive competency insofar as more complex social arrangements impelled more universalistic modes of reasoning. And fourthly, it by and large considered British Empire to be the practical, not necessarily innocent, means by which that universalisation would proceed. Well, Tyler Fraser and Hobhouse were writing in an era of increased inter-imperial competition. And concern for the empire's weakness set the scene for a concerted run towards colonial development in the early 20th century with a specific focus on African colonies. In 1922, Lord Lagarde laid out his thesis on the dual mandate of colonial rule, that is, 
to economically strengthen empire while simultaneously developing the competencies and capacities of the African native. And the 1929 Colonial Development Act provided funds for the purpose of aiding and developing agriculture and industry, but with a specific view to promoting commerce with or industry in the United Kingdom. During the following de decades, the key aims, purposes and methods of social anthropology became intimately affected by the imperatives of colonial development. And let's focus on one key intellectual here, Bronislaw Malinowski from the LSE. That's a dude there. In the year of the Colonial Development Act, Malinowski argued that anthropologists had previously sought to study <coughs> dim, quaint superstitions, but now their concern had to focus on how primitive politics and indigenous institutions worked in the present. Remember that the white abolitionist disposition marked a cultural and cognitive distance between the savage and the civilised. Well, to social anthropologists like Malinowski, colonial development now seemed to be compressing humanity's evolutionary stages. Instead of the pristine native, Malinowski proposed to study the changing native. Now that the lands, resources and labour of the tribe were being increasingly utilised by the colonial economy. But what characterised the interaction between the simple culture of the native with its myth, provinciality and unreflexivity and the complex culture of the European with its profanity, universalism and dynamism? Well, one word, disorder. Malinowski's comments on indirect rule are very instructive here. When colonial order depended upon the mediated upholding of native authority, Malinowski argued that social anthropology took on a particular unity, and that was to provide a sophisticated and accurate explanation of the deep-seated moral and legal force behind native sanction, which made a law-abiding citizen out of a so-called savage. See, indirect rule depended upon custom, and to subvert custom ran the risk of promoting what Malinowski called black Bolshevism. These tensions were nowhere more pronounced than in the settler colonies, especially Kenya, North and South Rhodesia, and South Africa, because there, colonial development required natives to move out of customary areas into mining towns and to work and live in close proximity to resident whites. In fact, social anthropologists considered urbanisation to be the preeminent challenge presented by colonial development to the study of the native. Malinowski suggested that through urbanisation, a new type of human being was being produced in the impact of European civilization on archaic Africa. Malinowski proposed that the westernized African developed through a number of stages. Firstly, the native became detribalized as he took up <coughs> Christianity, European schooling, and the labor contract. Secondly, the overwhelming superiority of European culture would compel him to renounce African values. Third, seeking European prestige and influence, he would enter the European university system and usually succeed in graduating. But fourth, upon returning to the colony, he would experience the colonial <coughs> colour bar and his aspirations to enter into white dominated occupations and positions would be fundamentally rebuffed. Fifth, in response, the native would fall back upon African beliefs and customs. Crucially, though, this return produced a mutant form of association that combined the ascriptive particularities of tribal life with the universal aspirations of civilised life. The result, sixth, was an explosion of tribal, regional, or pan-African nationalisms and separatist institutions such as black churches. Now remember this narrative. It's crucial for understanding how black deficit entered into the British Academy. And in that respect, let me turn 
briefly towards Malinowski's teacher and mentor at LSE, Charles Seligman. By the way, Seligman was a proponent of the theory that African civilization, such as there was, had been introduced by migrating pastoral European Hamites. Anyway, he was also convinced that the division between the conscious and unconscious was especially pervious in primitive peoples, leading to a far more instinctual temperament resulting in sudden tempestuous fits of anger, suggestibility and sexual liberty. Seligman was no theorist of hereditary difference. Nonetheless, his claims regarding primitive psychology resonate with Walter Bajou's imagery of a savage mind tattooed over with monstrous images. Now, in his earlier work in the Trobriand Islands, Malinowski had argued that myth in the primitive mind did not function in symbolic terms, but as a direct expression of its subject matter. And here, the fragility of the wall that separated the unconscious and conscious, the affective and the rational, are as palpable in Malinowski's descriptions as they are in his mentors. You see, Malinowski could have positively acknowledged the ability of the urbanising African to adapt the traditionally ascriptive, the tribal, to the necessities of the aspirational modern, the social. After all, adaptation was considered by social anthropologists to be a cultural attribute of complex societies. Instead, Malinowski presumed the native African to be cognitively unable to adapt through reason and only able to react by resentment to react by resentment rather than adapt by reason. And so for Malinowski, the movement from the rural to the urban did not encourage cultural and cognitive development in the African native. Rather, the native perverted such development so as to become a disorderly and dangerous subject. What was making it dangerous? The colour bar. You can't take this job because this job is just for whites. So might not Malinowski have simply advocated for the removal of that inequitous <coughs> object of race resentment? Ambivalence. In fact, Malinowski suggested that the architects of colonial development might instead work to pacify the fragile and mercurial black ego, dampen its expectations and not preach to Africans that a full identity with civilization can ever be reached by them. All these considerations raise the question as to the difference, if any, in dispositions between white abolitionism and this new one, colonial development. Well, firstly, social anthropologists inherited an evolutionary narrative that marked the hierarchical difference between savage and civilized cultures. Secondly, they were nonetheless forced to acknowledge that colonial development had materially shrunk the distance between savage and civilised. Thirdly, they also had to acknowledge the contradiction of pursuing a dual mandate, a contradiction that manifested in the colour bar that natives encountered in the urban milieu. Fourthly, they argued that the cultural deficit and cognitive incompetence through which natives experienced the colour bar provoked dangerous and destabilising reactions against colonial rule. And fifthly, they nonetheless believed that there was no choice but to civilise the native through empire. In summary, we might think about it all in these terms. The disposition towards colonial development was less a replacement of white abolitionism and more an intensification of its paradoxical pulls. An intensification fueled by urbanisation in the colonies. I need to be fair though, not all social, anth uh, social anthropologists were disposed towards colonial development in the same way. Take especially the Rhodes Livingston Institute, the first anthropological research unit to be situated in a British African colony, set up in northern Rhodesia in 1937. There, Godfrey Wilson, a student of Malinowski, and the Institute's first director, 
investigated urbanisation in the Rhodesian copper belt, a process that officials at the time denied was taking place. In 1941, South African social anthropologist Max Gluckman ends up having a very stellar career in Manchester in sociology. Gluckman replaced Wilson, but retained the focus on urbanisation. Gluckman drew issue with Malinowski's conceptual privileging of contact and change and his erasure of conflict. In effect, Gluckman oriented social anthropology away from the uh, cultural deficiencies and cognitive incompetencies of the urbanising African towards what he saw as the fundamental contradiction of colonial rule, one could not develop the empire and the native at the same time. One of Gluckman's appointees, Clyde Mitchell, I'm giving you all these names, let me just tell you why I'm giving you all this detail, right? Because oftentimes when we talk about decolonising the academy, we do it in a rhetorical flourish. Right? And what I'm trying to convey to you is that it's deep and it's detailed and there are people and issues and politics which resound even in the present. And we have to take it at that level. It's not just rhetoric. It's not rhetoric. People's lives are involved. Now, one of Gluckman's appointees, Clyde Mitchell, undertook a study of urbanisation that shared Gluckman's critique. Mitchell was far less concerned with the deficiencies of tribal culture than Malinowski. Here's Clyde. From the evidence we have at present, tribalism on the copper belt is still the dominant category of interaction in social fields in which Africans alone are involved. But tribalism is not a relevant category in the field of black-white relations. In other words, Wilson, Gluckman, Mitchell, at least partially reoriented the disposition of social anthropologists away from concerns over the integrity of empire and towards the politics of race relations. And at this precise moment in time, it's at the same time, social anthropologists in Britain were using cognate frameworks of urbanisation to study race relations in Britain. They did so as Commonwealth citizens moved from the colonies to the metropole, another urbanisation. In the summer of 1940, Kenneth Little began a PhD project looking at the black community of Cardiff's Tiger Bay, one of the oldest in, in the country. In reasonings with the community, Little came quickly to shift his focus towards an investigation of the colour bar experienced by them. In the same year as finishing the PhD, Little undertook his first spell of field work in Africa, specifically amongst the Mende peoples in Sierra Leone. A disposition towards colonial development, a la Malinowski, <coughs> is clear in this work as little tracked rural migration to mining towns and the destabilising effects that such urbanisation produced. But little self-consciously conceived the study of urbanisation in Africa and race relations in Britain <coughs> as one field conjoined by the methods and principles of social anthropology. He specifically argued that social anthropology was well adapted to the study of the enclaves of coloured people in this country. And he took this disposition to Edinburgh University where from 1949 he directed social anthropology research. At Edinburgh, Little supported and supervised a host of academics who made key contributions to the evolving British field of race relations. For example, Jamaican scholar Sidney Collins, who actually joined Edinburgh before Little. Collins undertook the first comparative study of Asian and African communities in Britain, focusing on northern English towns. The first person to do that was a black Jamaican. Nigerian scholar Ayo Ndem, undertook a study of coloured communities in Manchester, the city that had hosted the 1945 Pan-African Congress in which Ndem had taken part as representative of the Calabar Improvement League. And then there was Birmingham-born Michael Bantam, later to become a preeminent figure in the sociology of race, who undertook an investigation of the coloured quarter in the London Docklands. Here's the thing. The academic study of race relations in the British Academy arose first and foremost from the politics of British Empire 
and its interrogation by social anthropologists. I want to make this point really strongly. The race relations problem of colony to metropole migration was a surrogate to the colonial development problem of rural to urban migration. Once more, so you definitely catch it. <laughs> the race relations problem of colony to metropole migration was a surrogate to the colonial development problem of rural to urban migration. So, while Malinowski had studied the colour bar in the colonial urban, the Edinburgh programme relocated this encounter with race to the metropolitan urban. And therefore, Little and his fellows also transposed the qualitative difference between rural, native, simple culture, and urban, complex, civilised culture. They transposed this qualitative difference between rural and urban to the difference between colonial tradition settings, traditional settings and metropolitan modern inhabitations. So, just so you see it. They transposed the qualitative difference between rural cultures and urban cultures in the colonies. They transposed that to the qualitative difference between colonial traditional settings and metropolitan modern inhabitation. The question of race relations then was a derivative of that posed in the colonial situation, i.e. whether African natives could assimilate to English social life by leaving their tribal hinterlands behind. Eo Ndem's Manchester study sought to address this very question. Ndem focused upon the difference between status gained by ascription, which he associated with the traditional African system, and status again gained by achievement associated with the British social system. And them noticed that Africans resident in Britain could sidestep their ascriptive inferiority through achievement and thus raise their class. But in them noted that black aspiration was nonetheless dependent upon how their white class peers would accept their new status. And this acceptance was based not on achievement, but on the degree to which the African native eschewed the inferior behaviour and social norms ascribed to the native, such as raucous laughter. That's a cultural deficit if there ever was. So Ndem's study suggested that while the path to civilization for the black individual lay in self-development from the traditional ascriptive world to the modern achievement world, that path was in practice racialized. Now, in the colonies, the colour bar was formally institutionalised. But in Britain, impartial social advance was overwhelmingly moderated through informal arrangements, underpinned by racialised judgments of the individual's competency to inhabit Englishness. Don't laugh too loud. Britain's colour bar was informal and all the more stronger for it. Still, despite the formal informal distinction, an important one, similar fears of black disorder resulting from the colour bar are evident in the British investigations. Take especially Michael Banton. Here he is. The slights, rebuffs and discrimination, real and imagined, which they experience, may afterwards cause a reaction of resentment and may lead to a rejection of British cultural values and to political nationalism. Now, this is vintage Malinowski, the, the, the guy who begin, who, who's known as the kind of godfather of sociology of race in the UK. Is, he's channeling Malinowski. Reaction, resentment, rejection. And I want to clarify the stakes at play here by reference to black university students who, by the 1950s, had become a key concern of race relations. Sheila Kitzinger another Edinburgh scholar, had undertaken a study of African and Caribbean students at Oxbridge. She invited these students, um, she interviewed these students on the difficulties of constructing white-black friendships. This is what they said to her. They speak to you very nicely, but all the time they seem to be thinking, I wonder whether he can read. In fact, her interviewees reported 
that the relationship would break down when the white partner became embarrassed by the Negro's self-consciousness. The white shock of experiencing black cognitive competency in the heart of Babylon had a political resonance, especially in an era of decolonization. After all, these Commonwealth students would soon be leaders of the rising coloured nations whose friendship is important to the imperial country. Just as an aside, the, the people who were the main intellects and leaders of the black power movement in the UK, most of them were students from the Caribbean doing their degrees and then they went back. Given the political import of the Negro self-consciousness, I want to track a shift in Banton's thought, away from a Malinowski concern over black resentment and rejection of the white world towards, well, see what Banton did, although not single-handedly, is turn this social anthropological disposition towards the colour bar into a sociological one. He did so by promoting the utility of concepts such as in-group, out-group and the stranger. And it's this new conceptual language that by the 1960s has consolidated into a new field of race relations scholarship. But even this intellectual movement had a colonial provenance. Because Banton was especially influenced in this respect by Clyde Mitchell's work from the Rhodes Livingston Institute. Mitchell had deployed a social distance scale to study urbanisation in the settler colonies. Mitchell had argued that customary hospitality towards the stranger did not mean much in the urban area, while in the rural area it was imbued with much weightier issues to do with the permanent occupation of land. Well, Banton abstracted from Mitchell's work on colonial development and urbanisation, he abstracted from that to provide a broader proposition the category of the stranger determined social distance, but not all strangers were equal in all contexts. Some held particular characteristics that would mark their distance more. Applied to British race relations, the severity of the informal colour bar could thus be assessed by the degree to which particular contexts made the black body more of a dangerous stranger than at other times and places. For instance, a black male body in a mixed hostel was a problem, not so much in an all-male hostel. What was the effect of this new framing of the colour bar? As Banton put it, the problem evoked by the figure of the stranger is, he is not only uncertain of the societal norms, he cannot read the signs. Now, this means that black cultural deficit and cognitive incompetence was no longer parsed through the substantive question of imperial rule, but rather through a sociological problem, an abstract one, of rule recognition. Banton analogised the native, legally a British citizen at this time, by the way, these so-called strangers, legally a British citizen, he analogised the native to the stranger and thereby attenuated the empire to the nation. Okay, it's true. By this method, Banton ceased to follow Malinowski's attribution of cultural incompetency to black urban residents, an attribution that Banton himself had flirted with some years earlier. Still, this move makes me uncomfortable. And let me explain. The race relations disposition first appeared in British academia as a surrogate to colonial development and bound to the integrity of empire. As was evident in the critiques made at the Rhodes Livingston Institute, a reorientation away from concern for empire's integrity necessarily committed the scholar to a politics of race relations. But now in the new disposition of race relations, black cultural deficit and cognitive incompetence were abstracted into the sociological figure of the stranger. But the process of abstraction itself did not refute the ascription of deficit and incompetence to black people. To get where I'm coming from, let me quickly flesh out for you how I understand the meaning of disposition. 
See, a disposition is both an arrangement and an orientation. An intellectual arrangement of elements into a coherent problem and at the same time a clarification of ethical commitments to the redress of that problem. One cannot shift a disposition only through moral outcry or even through policy debate. What's required is a realigning of all the elements that orient the scholar towards her research commitments. So as the race relations disposition became consolidated, where was the sustained historical, methodological, conceptual refutation of the colonial premises of black deficit? A refutation developed in the academy and addressed to the British Academy itself? There was none. So what I'm saying is that you can defend black humanity and leave undisturbed not only the colonial hierarchy into which that humanity would be unfavourably inserted, you could also defend black humanity and leave undisturbed the associated assumption that only complex, universalistic societies, European, imperial ones, could solve the problem of race relations. That, my friends, still smells of white abolitionism after all these years. Consider this. At the same time that Banton was developing his notion of social distance and the stranger, Stuart Hall was studying in the halls of Oxford. The greatest British public intellectual of the 20th century, that's him, no shit, the greatest British public intellectual of the 20th century described his presence there not as a stranger, but as a familiar stranger. Here's Stuart's recollection. I was conscious all the time that I was very, very different because of my race and colour. And in the discourses of Englishness, race and colour remained unspeakable silences. There's an avowed self-reflexivity here. One that demonstrates that the complexity of sociological and anthropological law was possessed far more by the black native than by the white metropolitan. In the halls of Oxford, Stuart proceeded to reason with fellow colonial intellectuals on the values of cooperation and common ideals, torturously being negotiated at the time towards a West Indian federation. This with all the embarrassing accoutrements of Negro self-consciousness. So to conclude, as the field of race relations was consolidated in the British Academy, so did its disposition remain colonial insofar as black deficit was left an unspoken, albeit latent, premise. A dispositional refutation of black deficit? That was left largely to extra-academic black scholarship on the black presence in Britain. Let me give you a quick, quick sketch. By the early 1970s, the field of race relations has become politicised with the influence of civil rights, black power and liberation struggles. The Institute of Race Relations has become radicalised and its journal, Race and Class, becomes an explicitly anti-imperial digest. The new journal never enjoys a strictly academic home. In fact, the successful radicalisation of cultural studies by Stuart Hall in this era is the exception that proves the rule. Because while Stuart's project situated race and the black presence within Britain's post-colonial malaise, the field of avowedly black cultural studies just states mainly in North America, with a number of black British academics migrating there to carve out careers. Consider the career trajectory of Beverly Bryan, a former Black Panther, founding member of the Brixton Black Women's Group, who, receiving a PhD from the University of London, makes an academic career only by relocating to the University of West Indies. Accepting the longevity of individual intellectuals, an academic tradition of black thought on race, citizenship and empire, or as it was to be known in the US, black studies, never galvanised in the British Academy, until this year at least. 
In truth, black academia coalesced mainly outside of academia proper, in community-based institutions and initiatives. Some from those early days still write, teach and organise in a community setting, such as Cecil Gutsmore, PhD, who with Jackie Lewis hold weekly education sessions in Brixton as the Pan-African Society Community Forum. The International Book Fairs of Radical Black and Third World Books ran from 1982 to 1995, directed by John LaRose and Jessica Huntley. That's Jessica. New Beacon Books and Bogle Overture publications, owned by Jessica and husband Eric, as well as more recent fora such as Do Dr. Les Henry's New Beyond, all these testify to the vitality of extra academic black publishing. There's much more, but my point is this. Outside of the academy, there has been no end of intellectual initiatives that are premised on the black family and community being worldly sites of edification rather than dangerous ghettos of cultural deficit and cognitive incompetency. Compare to academia. In Britain, in 1985, the Swan Report finally refutes eugenicist explanations for the under of black students in secondary education. It's only in 1985 that the eugenicist explanation of why black children do worse <laughs> is refuted. Only 1985. But higher education in the UK has never had a swan report. Never. The assumption that black people enter the urban, the modern, the English, the university with a dangerously destabilising cultural deficiency and cognitive incompetency, that assumption remains to be categorically and institutionally refuted in the British Academy. That unspoken assumption is marked in the differentials of experience and attainment suffered by black students today and it has real consequences. Current initiatives to decolonise the academy should be critically assessed vis-a-vis -vis this concrete imperial legacy and not via white fantasies of a blameless space dedicated to critique, curiosity and discernment. Friends, new intellectual dispositions are required for our fascistic era. Dispositions that do not fall back on white abolitionism or colonial development but rather confidently and critically orient Negro self-consciousnesses alongside all consciousnesses towards the pressing problems of our age. Thank you. <laughs>